Hi guys, Rod from Insane Thought Videos here, and this is the eighth video in my series examining the underlying philosophy that gives rise to the scientific method. So in this series, we are examining the tools that power the scientific method, particularly focusing on mathematics. We are also following a very narrow path, developing the necessary mathematical tools to prove Einstein's famous E equals MC squared equation. Now in my last video, we introduced the topic of the special theory of relativity, which comes about because the speed of light must be conserved independent of the observer's frame of reference. In other words, if a person on a spacecraft is travelling towards a light ray at half the speed of light, they must measure the speed of light as c, just as the person who is in a different reference frame travelling away from the spacecraft at half the speed of light must also measure the same light ray at the same speed. Now we saw in order for these experimental observations to be true, a linear transform must be applied when comparing one inertial reference frame to the other. This transform contains what is known as the gamma factor which is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus v squared divided by c squared. We shall now see that when we put this factor into our equation for kinetic energy and with some algebraic manipulation, we will end up finding that the rest energy of an object equals its mass times the speed of light squared. Yet we need one important new tool of mathematics to help us do that and that is the ability to calculate instantaneous velocities and accelerations. So let's now develop the mathematics that is the basis of this new tool, which is commonly referred to as calculus. We shall begin by adding some more mathematical nomenclature. We have already defined a function and have written down several examples, such as y equals x squared. But we now need some syntax to express a function without specifying what it is. We can do this simply by using a single letter with open and closed brackets, and the independent variable of the function goes inside those brackets. Thus, y equals fx means a function that takes its input from a single variable, does some unspecified set of mathematical operations on it, and spits out a new value y. If the function had three inputs, then it could be written like this. y equals f open brackets x comma z comma s close brackets. We are now going to consider the function y equals 4x squared minus 4 divided by x minus 1. This function is not defined when x equals 1 because the denominator of the function is 0. And as we have learned previously, you cannot divide by 0 because anything multiplied by 0 equals 0. However, with the exception of that one point, the function is defined throughout the rest of its domain, and a plot of the function looks like a straight line, with a single missing point at x equals 1. However, from the graph, it is clear that because every other point of the function exists, if you were to travel along the line of the function, then at x equals 1, the y value would be 8 because all the other points around this single point would push you to that non-defined point. It is this type of behaviour that led mathematicians to develop the concept of a limit. Mathematically, we assume that if the function at a certain value x is not defined, but has a limit value of l when x is equal to c, then if we put another value into the function, which is not c, then the value the function spits out can be written as the limit value, L, plus another value, delta, where delta is the difference between the value of the function at its current value and the limit value we claim the function would display if it was defined when x equals c. We then state that as x gets closer and closer to the value c, delta gets less and less approaching the value 0. If this is the case, then it means that the limit of the function exists and is the value L as the independent variable approaches the value C. We can see this behaviour with our example function 
in that as x approaches 1, y is getting closer and closer to the value 8, as indicated by delta getting closer and closer to the value 0. In passing, it is important to realise that not all functions that are undefined at a certain value in their domain have a limit at that point. For example, the function y equals 1 over x has no limit as x approaches 0, because y gets larger and larger without converging on a certain value, so it is undefined and has no limit when x equals 0. Now consider the equation y equals the limit as x approaches 0 of x over x. We can see that as long as x does not equal 0, then x over x always equals 1. Therefore, the limit as x over x approaches 0 is trivial to determine, as it must be 1, since this is the value the function spits out at every other value in its domain. More generally, we can write that if a function is undefined at value a, then the limit as x approaches a of the function divided by itself will also be 1 because a function divided by itself will always equal 1 over all the domain where it is defined. We can use this important limit to help us algebraically determine the limit of a function without manually creating a table of values or graphing it as we did with our first y equals 4x squared minus 4 over x minus 1 example. The trick is if we have a function say fx that is not defined at x equals a but we can algebraically manipulate it to put it in the form of gx over gx times hx, where gx and hx are new functions derived from the original, then if hx is now defined at a, then we know that the limit as x approaches a of gx over gx must equal 1. So therefore, the value hx spits out when x is equal to a will be the limit of the original function y equals fx. We shall now use this method on our example equation. So with our example equation, we can factor out x minus 1. The algebra in blue and yellow show the reverse expansion back to the original numerator. We then immediately see that x minus 1 divided by x minus 1 is in the form gx over gx, and so is simply 1. Now our modified function 4x plus 4 is clearly defined at x equals 1, and is equal to 8. This is the limit we determined for our original function 4x squared minus 4 divided by x minus 1 using a graph and also a table of values as x approach 1. And so this demonstrates that our new method is clearly working. We can now apply our limit tools to the physics problem of determining an instantaneous velocity at a single time point as follows. So let's imagine we have some bloke accelerating on a motorbike such that the distance he travels each minute is equal to the time elapsed since starting his journey raised to the fourth power. If we graph this relationship and also create a table of values for the distance he has travelled for the first 10 minutes, we end up with the following graph and table. We now wish to calculate the motorbike's instantaneous velocity at 4 minutes. We already know that the velocity is defined as distance travelled over time taken, or more precisely, the change in spatial location over the time it took to move from point A to point B. Yet if the velocity is continuously changing during the elapsed period, then the overall velocity our formula gives will only be the average velocity over that time period. In our example, we shall calculate the average velocity for each minute by taking the distance the bike has travelled at the end of that minute and subtract the distance it had travelled in the previous minute. The time elapsed between each minute is just one minute, so we just divide our calculated difference by one. This calculation produces the following table of average velocities. You can see that at four minutes the average velocity of the bike was 190 metres per minute, whereas at five minutes it was 435 metres per minute. Now because the velocity is continuously increasing, we know that the true instantaneous velocity of the bike at 4 minutes must be greater than 190 metres per minute, as the average velocity was calculated by taking the distance travelled over the 3rd to 4th minute. Therefore, it is really giving us the average velocity between 3 and 4 minutes, 
which must be less than the true velocity at the four minute mark. Likewise, the average velocity at five minutes must be greater than the instantaneous velocity at four minutes because the five minute value is calculated by taking the distance traveled over the fourth to fifth minute and so is really the average velocity between the fourth and fifth minute which must be greater than the instantaneous velocity at the four minute mark. However, we can start to get to the real instantaneous velocity at four minutes by looking at shorter and shorter time intervals around the four minute mark. If we calculate the average velocity from 3.5 to 4.5 minutes, we get 260 meters. If we narrow the time even further to say 3.75 to 4.25 minutes, we get 257 meters. Finally, we can create a table of values where the time measurement is getting shorter and shorter, converging around the four minute mark. You can see from this table that as we take shorter and shorter intervals around the four minute mark, the average velocity gets closer to the true instantaneous velocity of 256 meters per minute. If we were to state the limit of the velocity function was 256 meters per minute, then as our two time values converge to four minutes, delta approaches zero. So the resultant equation is meeting the property of a limit that we defined earlier. However, as before, we want to come up with a way of evaluating our instantaneous rate of change function without having to tediously resort to calculating lots of numerical values of the function as our time interval approaches a single value. Once again, we make use of the fact that if we can take our rate of change function and rewrite it such that we create two new functions, one which is of the form gx over gx, which we know has its limit equal to one, and another function that is defined when x equals the single time value we are trying to evaluate, then we can simply use the new function we have derived to get the limit value that we want. This new function is given the special nomenclature of f dash x. The dash is commonly referred to by the word prime, so we also say f prime x. This nomenclature indicates that our new function was derived from the original function fx by placing it into our rate equation and taking the limit where the two values in the rate equation converge to a single value. Mathematically, the rate equation is simply a change in y divided by a change in x. If we let one of the x values equal c, then this becomes fx minus fc divided by x minus c. We now take the limit where x gets closer and closer to c, so that the limit as x approaches c is simply fx minus fc divided by x minus c. If this limit is L, then our new derivative function f prime x evaluated at c will give the limit value L because our new function f prime x is defined at c even though our original function fx minus fc over x minus c is not. Well, let's see how this all works using our y equals t raised to the fourth power function. In this example, we shall let x equal t plus h, the time plus a small increment, and c will simply equal t. This means fx will equal t plus h raised to the fourth power, and fc will equal t to the fourth power. Now the way we have set this up, x approaching c is the same as h approaching zero, since when h equals zero, t plus h equals t. Note this is just another way of writing our instantaneous rate of change function, and when deriving derivatives from first principles, we tend to make use of both forms of the equation either using the limit as x approaches c or h approaches zero, depending on which one produces the most easily manipulated algebra. Returning to our current example, we get the instantaneous velocity is equal to the limit as h approaches zero of t plus h raised to the fourth power minus t to the fourth power, all divided by t plus h minus t. The denominator simplifies simply to h. 
we now need to algebraically manipulate this function and we are going to do that by expanding t plus h to the fourth power. So t plus h to the fourth power is the same as t plus h times t plus h times t plus h times t plus h. We shall first expand t plus h times t plus h. I have colour coded the terms from the first two bracketed expressions so you can see how they combine. The t squared and the h squared are coded pink indicating they consist of an h and t from each bracketed expression. Expanding the first two bracketed expressions we get t squared plus 2ht plus h squared. We now repeat the process, this time multiplying t squared plus 2ht plus h squared by itself as shown again using yellow and green to keep track of the terms. This results in the rather long looking expression t to the fourth plus 2t cubed h plus t squared h squared plus 2t cubed h plus 4t squared h squared plus 2t h cubed plus h squared t squared plus 2t h cubed plus h to the fourth. Gathering like terms we get t to the fourth plus 4t cubed h plus 6t squared h squared plus 4t h cubed plus h to the fourth. So putting our expansion back into our rate equation we see that first the t to the fourth terms disappear as t to the fourth minus t to the fourth equals zero. We then factor out h in the denominator to get h open brackets 4t cubed plus 6t squared h plus 4t h squared plus h cubed close brackets divided by h. We have already seen that the limit as h approaches 0 of h over h is 1. So now the h over h can be cancelled leaving 4t cubed plus 6t squared h plus 4t h squared plus h cubed. However if we now let h equal 0 we see that all the terms in this equation multiplied by h disappear because 0 times anything equals 0. So we are just left with the equation for the instantaneous velocity equal to 4t cubed. This is the derivative function of y equals t to the fourth power. Now at this point we need some more math syntax to cover what we have just done which is called differentiation. So we have already stated that the derivative function is just the original function with a dash in it. So we have seen that y prime equals f prime x is the derivative function of y equals fx. Yet mathematicians also write dy dx instead of y prime to express the derivative function. The origin of this nomenclature is from the rate function itself. Remember it is written as the limit as delta x approaches 0 of delta y over delta x. So it makes sense to refer to the limit by the letter d, which is the modern anglicized version of the Greek letter delta, used to express the concept of change. Thus, if y equals t to the fourth, then dy dx equals 4t cubed, or y prime equals 4t cubed. Remember the dash can also be called prime. OK, so using our derivative function, remember we were trying to find the instantaneous velocity at 4 minutes. We simply plug 4 into our equation and we get 4 times 4 cubed, which is 256 metres per minute, which is what we had calculated manually using a table of values where the elapsed time got shorter and shorter around the central value of 4 minutes. We now want to develop an expression for the general derivative of a polynomial x to the n where n can be any number. However to do this we need to expand x plus h raised to the n power. In order to do this we need to first establish the overall pattern of expanding x plus h multiple times. So returning to when we raised x plus h to the fourth power we shall now examine closely how each of the terms of the expansion actually came about. The first term, t to the 4, was easy 
as this is just all the t's in the brackets multiplied together as shown. There is only one way to do this because there is only four t's in our expansion. Because it is four t's, it means that the first term must be one times t to the four. Now we come to our second term of t cubed h. In this example, we multiplied three t's together from three of the brackets and one h. Now as shown on the screen, there is exactly n ways we can do that because each way uses a different h from each bracketed term. So we end up with four t cubed h as our second term. Now the third term is multiplying two t's by two h's to end up with t squared h squared. Now it turns out there are six different ways we can do this and these are now being shown on the screen. Our fourth term is now three h's multiplied together by a single t. Like our second term, there is only four ways we can do this because we must use a different t each time and there are only four t's inside the four bracketed terms. Thus, we end up with four t h cubed. Our last term is just multiplying all the h's together. And of course, there is only one way to do that, resulting in h being raised to the fourth power, as shown. So let's now look at the pattern that has emerged. Well, firstly, all the terms in our expansion are of the form c times t raised to a times h raised to b, where a plus b equals n, and n is the number of bracketed terms that is in the overall expression. C is simply a constant. The first and last terms are t raised to the n and h raised to the n, where the number of ways of getting these terms is only one, so C is equal to one. The second and penultimate terms are of the form t raised to the n minus one times h and t times h raised to the n minus 1. Both these terms have a constant in front of them equal to n because there are n ways of forming these terms as each term requires a different single h or t as we have only n of those in the expansion. The middle term is of the form t squared h squared and we found in this example there were six ways of multiplying the terms in the brackets to form this term. Thus the constant for this term was six. However, when we come to do the general expansion, it will suffice to just leave these constants unevaluated as we shall see shortly. Now we have this pattern, we are ready to develop the general derivative of x to the n power. So we begin with the expression on the screen. Note yet another piece of mathematical syntax. Here I have replaced y in the dy dx with the actual function, which is yet another valid way of writing the expression. So expanding x plus h to the n, we know the first term will just be x to the n and the last term will be h to the n. We also know that the second term is n times x raised to the n minus one times h and the penultimate term is n times x times h raised to the n minus 1. Now we just have to put in all the middle terms, which I've done in light purple. You can see the pattern in these terms, with x powers decreasing by 1 as we move from term to term, from left to right, while the h powers are increasing by 1. Because n is an unspecified constant, we cannot write down all the terms, so we simply use a three dot symbol to develop the pattern and then skip to the end terms. For each of these terms, there will be a certain number of them, which I have assigned using the letter C and a subscript to denote which term the C applies to. It is possible to use a formula to determine what C actually equals. 
However, as we shall see in a moment, we do not need to calculate the actual value because all these terms will disappear when we take the limit. So we now take this expression and plug it into the numerator of our rate function as shown. Once again, we see that x to the n cancels with the minus x to the n. We can then factor out an h and we can then cancel out the h in the numerator and denominator because the limit as h approaches 0 of h over h is equal to 1. This then just leaves the formula on the screen. Now if we let h equal 0, all the terms beyond the first one disappear because they all have h in them and anything multiplied by 0 is 0. Thus, we are just left with the derivative of x to the n equal to n x to the n minus 1. This is a really powerful equation because with this we can differentiate a whole class of functions as n can be any number. So on the screen I have produced four different functions which can quickly be differentiated to give our four new functions as shown. The first function of course is just our example function which as you can see differentiates using our new formula to the function we derived when we differentiated it using the limit formula. So where did mathematicians go from here? Well as you might imagine they began to derive whole classes of differential equations to cover the many classes of equations that can be built using our maths nomenclature. For example on the screen is the derivative of the exponential function. What is interesting about the derivative of this function is it gives back an exponential function times a constant in yellow. If we can adjust the value of a so that the constant equals 1, then we have a new function which is unchanged by differentiation. In fact, there is a number that meets this requirement and its value is approximately equal to 2.7182818 and is given the special letter E. However, these other differential function classes are not necessary for proving our energy equals mass times the speed of light squared formula, so they shall not be explored further. Yet what is necessary is a few more differentiation rules which help expand what we can differentiate. The first rule is that the derivative of a constant is zero. The elementary proof is now shown on the screen. Obviously, fx plus h will simply be c, and so will fx. So we get c minus c equals 0 over h. Now the limit of 0 over h as h approaches 0 is 0, because the function is 0 for every other non-zero value of h. The next rule is the derivative of functions added together is just the derivative of each separate function added together and again the proof is now shown on the screen. Although this proof is fairly obvious, this rule makes differentiating a complex sum of functions very easy. The next important rule is called the chain rule and this one turns out to be incredibly important at helping us differentiate functions. If we have a function of a function say y equals g fx, where u equals fx, then the chain rule states that dy dx equals dy du times du dx. This rule is very easy to remember because this is exactly what you would expect if differentials were just standard fractions. The reason it works is because differentials are in many ways like standard fractions because the functions behave as standard fractions up until the point where the function is not defined. We can see this in the proof of the chain rule which is now shown on the screen. If we just differentiate the function of a function we get dy dx equals the limit as x approaches c of g fx minus g fc all divided by x minus c. If we now let u equal fx then we get y equals gu and u equals fx. Differentiating these two functions individually and then multiplying the differentials together, we get the limit as u approaches uppercase C of gu minus g uppercase C divided by u minus uppercase C. 
The reason we have used uppercase C is to distinguish it from the value X approaches because as X approaches lowercase C, function X is most likely approaching a different value which we have called uppercase C. This function is dy du. The function du dx is then simply the limit as x approaches c of fx minus fc over x minus c, c now being lowercase. The u minus uppercase c is just fx minus fc because uppercase c is the value the function f takes when x equals lowercase c and u is the general value f takes given value x. We can now cancel the denominator of the first expression with the numerator of the second as the limit as x approaches c of a function over itself is simply equal to 1 as we have already discussed. This just leaves us with the limit as x approaches c of gu minus g uppercase c over x minus c but gu is simply g fx while g uppercase c is simply g fc which is the same identity as the expression for dy dx thus dy dx equals dy du times du dx which proves the chain rule an example of using the chain rule is now shown here we have the equation y equals open brackets 3x cubed plus 4 over x plus 6 close brackets all squared. We now let u equal 3x cubed plus 4 over x plus 6. y now equals u squared or dy du just equals 2u. u equals 3x cubed plus 4 over x plus 6 or du dx equals 9x squared minus 4 over x squared. Using the chain rule we get dy dx equals 2u times 9x squared minus 4 over x squared. Putting back 3x cubed plus 4 over x plus 6 for u and multiplying throughout we get dy dx equals 54x to the fifth minus 24x plus 72x minus 32 over x cubed plus 108x squared minus 48 over x squared which simplifies to 54x to the fifth plus 108x squared plus 48x minus 48 over x squared minus 32 over x cubed. One can also do this calculation without using the chain rule by first squaring 3x cubed plus 4 over x plus 6 and then differentiating the answer in a single step. Although in this example we made a formal substitution of u, this step is often omitted as the chain rule can be applied directly as we shall do when we work towards the famous energy equals mass times the speed of light squared relationship in a few videos time. The final rule we require is a rule for when we have one function multiplied by another as now shown on the screen. If we have two functions fx times gx, then the derivative is f prime x times gx plus g prime x times fx. In order to prove this, we shall use the h approaches zero instantaneous rate of change equation. Now dy dx is equal to the limit as h approaches zero of f open brackets x plus h times g open brackets x plus h minus fx times gx over h. Now we are going to use a very clever trick. We are going to add and subtract the term fx times g open brackets x plus h. By adding and subtracting this term we do not change the equation as this is equivalent to adding 0. Yet now the two terms in green are present we can factor out g x plus h from the first two terms in the numerator and fx from the remaining terms as shown. Once we have done this, we see that the first bracketed terms is just f prime x times g open brackets x plus h. But when h equals zero, 
at the limit, we are just left with gx. So it now becomes f prime x times gx plus fx times the final bracketed term, which is just g prime x. And so we have proved the product rule identity. Well, let's finish off this video by using our product rule to differentiate the same function that we applied our chain rule to just a moment ago. Now, normally we would not apply the product function where the product is two identical functions, but we are doing it here for demonstration purposes. So we have fx and gx equal to 3x cubed plus 4 over x plus 6. The derivative of this expression is 9x squared minus 4 over x squared, as we showed before. So using the product rule, we get open brackets, 9x squared minus 4 over x squared close brackets times open brackets, 3x cubed plus 4 over x plus 6 close brackets plus open brackets, 3x cubed plus 4 over x plus 6 close brackets times open brackets, 9x squared minus 4 over x squared close brackets. This equals 2 times open brackets 3x cubed plus 4 over x plus 6 close brackets times open brackets 9x squared minus 4 over x squared close brackets, which as expected is the exact same expression we got when we used the chain rule to differentiate this function. From here we can fully expand the terms in the brackets to end up with the final expression 54x to the fifth plus 108x squared plus 48x minus 48 over x squared minus 32 over x cubed, as we did before using the chain rule. We shall make use of all these rules when we come to introduce the Lorentz gamma factor into our energy equations which will ultimately result in Einstein's famous energy equals mass times the speed of light squared equation. Yet before we can do that, we will need to examine the reverse or inverse function of differentiation, and that is called integration. That will be the topic of the next video, and will complete our maths toolkit required to prove Einstein's famous formula. Okay, so that is it for this week. If you like this video, then please do hit the like key, and if you want to see more of my content, then please do subscribe to my channel by hitting the subscribe button and the bell notification key below. Until next time, I hope your body and mind are in a good place. Bye for now.